This episode of Style in Real Life is about a man who personified the word style for an entire sport. He is a BMX legend, and his name is Mike Aitken. Now Aitken's a little bit different than other men that I've covered in this series because his style isn't just exemplified in the clothing that he wears, but in every single facet of how he was involved in the BMX world. It may sound a bit hyperbolic, but Mike Aitken was the single biggest influence when it came to transitioning the BMX scene from its mid-school phase into its current iteration. The way riders' bikes are set up, the clothes they wear, the tricks that they perform, and this omnipresent idea of trying to make everything look effortless all comes from Mike Aitken and the way that he rode when he was at the top of his game. Born in the early 80s, Aitken grew up racing a BMX bike, and it was at these races that he got exposed to professional dirt jumpers like Matt Berenger and Tim Fuzzy Hall. Now, Fuzzy was known at this time because he had a backyard that was packed to the brim with berms, jumps, doubles, lines, anything else you wanted to ride a BMX bike. Now, Aitken's racing background is what created this almost fearless kid who quickly started to separate himself from his peers. And while he had a few sponsors and got a few photos in magazines like Ride and BMX Plus in the late 90s, he didn't really start to blow up until joining Fit, which at the time was a new company that had a roster of riders that were really going to shape the entire industry. In the early 2000s, there were two main camps as far as how BMX bikes were rode. The first camp consisted of guys like Dave Mira, Jamie Bestwick, Matt Hoffman, Ryan Nyquist, who were interested in pushing the sport as far as they possibly could. Now, mostly what that meant was removing as many limbs as possible while simultaneously spinning or flipping or bar spinning or tail whipping or just doing as technical and as big a tricks as they could possibly come up with and largely doing this on the contest scene with things like the X Games and eventually the Dew Tour and other contest series. The second camp consisted of guys like Taj Mihalik, Joe Rich, Brian Castillo, guys who didn't compete very much, if at all. And while these other guys, Mira and the like, were trying to make the sport as appealing and crowd-pleasing to people who never learned how to do so much as a bunny hop, these other guys like Rich and Mihalik and Castillo, they were focusing on a version that was a little bit more raw. And yes, there was a little bit of a style focus, but it was mostly about finding the most unique spots, jumping the biggest gaps, and creating video parts that were really only appealing to guys who bled and slept BMX. Now, even though these guys were doing stuff that wasn't super crowd-pleasing, the pressure was still on to make the stakes higher. They had to go bigger, they had to get more technical, they had to get more unique and get more interesting. It was still about pushing the sport and doing something new, 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 new. Rather than come up with something new or always pushing the envelope as far as technicality or where it was done, he stuck with tricks that had been around from like the neon clad eras of the 80s, stuff like the movie Rad. I mean, these were tricks like tabletops, turndowns, tuck no handers, some of the most simple and fundamental and basic moves in the sport. And then rather than trying to move past these time-tested variations, his whole approach was to just make them look better. He would go higher, he would tweak the trick a little bit farther, he would hold it a little bit longer, and he was always doing it again and again and again until it visually just looked better. Essentially, both camps were focusing on new things, and Aitken went back old school and just brought a new element of style into it that made it so appealing to anybody who was watching. Guys on either camp loved watching Aitken ride. Riders who were multiple years his senior would often ride with him and feel embarrassed because he could do a trick that they were doing since before he could even pedal a bike, and he made it look like he could do it so effortlessly and made their versions of it just look clunky and awkward and not nearly as polished as what this kid was pulling off. Now this is not to say that he wasn't capable of doing technical tricks and big moves. In fact, when he did, it often surprised people because they were so used to seeing these fundamentals. And what's so cool is even when he would do these things, these backflips or tail whips or other things that were considered to be crowd pleasers, he just made them look good, just like he made everything else look good. And not just look good, but look good in a way that it would be fun. Well, one of the things that I think was so appealing about Aitken, especially when he was in his prime, is that whether you were watching him ride in a contest or seeing his video parts, or if you're like me and were lucky enough to have the privilege of actually being there in person to see him ride a few times, it just felt like he was there having a regular day, that the scores didn't matter or the video cameras didn't matter, that it was just about having something be smooth 
and fun and feel as good as it ended up looking. And that was, I think what was so appealing about it is he just seemed like the really, really good guy at your local trails that wasn't caught up in status and competitions and the best video parts and all these other things that made up the BMX industry in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Now again, he did certainly care about these things. In fact, he cared a lot. A lot of the guys who rode with him a lot said that Aiken was harder on himself than most any other rider. And his getting to that point of style was certainly not effortless, but it looked effortless. It looked fun, and yes, even though he was hard on himself, he had fun doing it. And for guys like me who grew up watching him ride and idolizing him, I think that was ultimately what made him so appealing. So not only did Aitken change the way that a lot of riders, if not most of the riders in the world of BMX rode, he had a huge impact on the way that their bikes were set up. Prior to his rise in popularity, and I remember this from personal experience, the trend of bikes was to make them as big and heavy and as bulletproof as you could possibly get them. Because guys were doing big things, whether that was big gaps out in the street or big jumps at the skate park, and trying to push the envelope so consistently that those bikes were getting thrown around, beaten up, and destroyed like crazy. And so we sacrificed weight and flexibility and all these other things for strength because ultimately that was what we needed in our bikes. And not only was it about making them as heavy and as bulletproof as possible, but also facilitating as much as those technical tricks as possible. And so it was things like gyros and bash guards and as many pegs as you could fit on there and just having them be kind of this ultimate machine to facilitate as much technicality and as much strength as you could possibly fit onto a single bicycle. And just like he did when it came to the actual execution and how he rode, Aitken focused on simplicity with the way that his bike was set up. Often, he would be without brakes, and if he did have brakes on, it wasn't a gyro, there was never a front brake, it was just a simple cable. Same thing goes with pegs. Most of the time, he'd have a single set on, but sometimes he would ride without pegs at all. So he would take kind of these overcomplicated machines that we were used to seeing and distill it back into a bike that looked more like it belonged on the racetrack than it did at the skate park. And the most glaring difference was the way that his seat was set up. And for outsiders, this could seem like something that's so trivial, but really it was a big deal when he decided to do his seat set up a little bit differently than everybody else. During this time, most riders would have their seat set up relatively high because what it allowed you to do was pinch that seat with your knees and then take your hands off the handlebars without the front end dropping. You would use your knees to kind of keep it all together. And so this was huge as guys were doing bar spins and other tricks that required them to take their hands off. Rather than following suit, Aitken saw this setup and realized that it was a problem for him because the tricks that he was doing, turn downs and tabletops, that seat being set up the way it was, it would get in the way. So he embraced the fact that he wasn't doing these technical tricks, he was focusing on simple tricks, and so he slammed his seat down onto the top tube as far as it could get. It didn't serve any purpose for him other than occasionally being able to sit on it between runs, and it aesthetically looked so different than anything anybody else was doing, and it was a statement. It was him saying, I don't need to do bar spins, I don't need to do suicide no-handers, I don't need to focus on technical, I am fully committed, even in the way that my bike is set up, that I'm just gonna focus on these simple, tried and true tricks and I'm going to make them look as good as I possibly can. Not only did he make those changes to omit any of the technical need, but his bike was light. He again continued to pull from his racing history and focused on a bike setup that was light because at this point you had freestyle or bicycle stunt or whatever it was that we were calling at that point the guys who were doing the tricks and our bikes were heavy and then you had racers who wanted their bikes to be as light as possible and Aitken combined both because he didn't need a bike to be bulletproof because while he was doing things big and crazy, he was doing them so smoothly that it wasn't as hard on his bike as it was for other guys. And so he could get away with having lighter stuff, which ultimately allowed him to tweak his tricks further, make his style look even better, and just continue to facilitate this unique style of riding that he had. His influence along with improvements in technology have totally changed the idea of how a bike should be set up and what it should weigh. These old, heavy, monstrous bikes that we used to be on are now as vintage and as outdated as a pair of rollerblades or a flip phone. Now obviously with it being this channel and talking about Aitken's style, we can't do this video without talking about how it actually translated over into his clothing choices. He first came onto the scene in an era of baggy pants, long past the knee shorts and chain wallets, and man do I remember wearing those things. But he quickly changed things when he started embracing a style that back in 2003, 2004 was a little bit risky and now is completely ubiquitous. It's the idea of skinny pants. The power of this move is lost because they've become so commonplace that everybody knows somebody who's either worn skinny pants or tried them out or fully embraced them. 
Skinny pants for men is now a normal thing, but you go back 15 years ago and that was not the case. One of the challenges that has plagued BMX riders for years, for years, is the idea that your pants get caught in between your sprocket and your chain. Now, back in the 80s, in fact, if you go watch the old movie Rad, you can see a great example of this. What riders would do is they would take a bandana and tie it around their leg. And when they weren't riding, they would have it up at their thigh. And then when they were riding, they would put it back down around the ankle and it was supposed to cinch up those pant legs and so they wouldn't get caught in between the sprocket and the chain. The problem with that is that the bandana would often end up suffering the same fate and just getting caught there, which would throw things off. It's a pain to try and get that pulled out. It's just a mess. Later on, especially in this time of like the mid-school, most riders would either just ride in shorts or we would just deal with it. At the time that Aitken made this change, there were not any companies that were making skinny pants for men. He and other riders like him knew that this was a problem. They knew that they wanted to figure out a way to solve it. And so the best solution they could come up with was to get girl pants. And that's why you guys may not remember this, but the idea, the ridicule that comes from skinny pants now, I remember back in 2004 getting teased because I was wearing girl pants. They were literally girl pants. I would go to the thrift store and I would shop in the women's section because that was the only place you could find pants that were actually skinny. And so all the kids like me who desperately wanted to be like Mike Aitken uh, adopted the same style. From there, guys at the skate park who were not into BMX, skateboarders, rollerbladers would see that and kind of like it. And then from there, it started to expand into music because at this time, most of us were into punk rock or emo or metal or other versions of rock and roll. And so it started to expand out from there. And then eventually it has become what you now know as skinny pants. So like them or not, you know what skinny pants are because of Mike Aitken. But his style wasn't just in how skinny his pants were. Guys wanted to emulate that he just had the perfect amount of sag. In fact, I remember reading magazine interviews and people would be talking about how Aitken had the perfect amount of sag in his pants. It was in his oversized t-shirts that wouldn't restrict any movement and make it easier for him to be able to pull off the tricks that he was doing. It was in his hair and his hat choices and eventually even in his headgear. Now by headgear, I mean his helmet, and Aitken wasn't always an advocate of wearing helmets. But shortly after his due tour win in 2008, he was filming for an upcoming video part at a set of trails, doing a trick that he's done hundreds of times before when he over-rotated and landed on his face. He ended up breaking his eye socket, a few other bones in his face, knocked himself out cold, and he was in a coma for three weeks. He went from being at the top of his game, one of the best and most legendary riders in the industry, to being someone who didn't know how to feed himself. He had to relearn how to swallow, how to walk, how to use the entire right side of his body. Within five weeks, he walked out of the hospital on his own two feet, and within six months, he was back on his bike again. To this day, he still suffers some negative effects from that major crash, but is ultimately able to live a normal and a happy life with his wife and his son. However, one thing that has permanently changed with Aitken is that now whenever he is on his bike, he is always in a helmet. And true to form for Mike Aitken, it's not the regular skate helmet that you see all the time at the park, nor is it the big full face motorcycle style helmet that you see the guys who do the vert ramps or the big air jumps like you see at Nitro Circus. It's neither one of those. Instead, he went with an old school over the ear style that is both familiar in vintage, but also unique and not commonly seen anymore. While Aitken is not as prominent as he used to be, he's not competing, he's not throwing out jaw-dropping video parts anymore, he's still a legend in BMX. He's still someone that young kids coming into the scene look up to as one of the movers and shakers, one of the shapers of the entire sport. Someone who guys who've been around for decades know that name and know the respect and everything that comes along with it. And even though he may not be throwing new tricks or doing new things or even pushing himself the way that he used to, you go to any skate park today and you will still see the results of his style changes. Changes that he made in the way that he rode, in the way that he set up his bike, and in the clothes that he chose to wear. Based on all of the above criteria, I'm gonna put Aitken at 46% rugged, 46% rakish, and 8% refined. Now for you guys who have been following me for a little while, you may be wondering why I'm putting him so much rugged because as you've been seeing the photos and the clips of this throughout this video, his style aesthetically leans super rakish and I understand that. 
but from a functional perspective, which is the foundation of the rugged aesthetic. Your clothing serves a physical function. That's the reason he started wearing skinny pants. That's the reason why his shirts were as baggy as they were. That's why he continues to wear a helmet today. It's functional style. For those of you guys who have no idea what I'm talking about, I encourage you to go check this out. This is a link to a seven question quiz that will give you an idea of what your main style archetype is, rugged, refined, or rakish. And knowing that is huge because once you know that, you can know the direction that you should start heading towards in this journey of dressing better. Otherwise, it can feel like you're kind of all over the place and you're gonna pull style cues from this guy and that guy, and it can feel messy and kind of hodgepodge. But if you know the direction that you wanna head, if you know who the guys are that you wanna look up to, if you know what the style is that you wanna accomplish, it's so much easier to execute on it. So if you have not taken this yet, I encourage you to go check out this quiz, seven questions, and I'm gonna give you a breakdown of what your archetype is and some ideas on how you can start dressing to best suit that. I hope you guys enjoy the video. Leave me your comments below. As always, please leave a thumbs up. That helps me grow the channel, and I will catch you guys on the next one.